Mark Zuckerberg is planning to launch his Libra cryptocurrency. Wait, has he already changed his mind? Pavel Durov was banned from issuing Torn cryptocurrency on top of his Telegram Messenger. At the same time, the digital yuan is already in full swing in China, and the central banks of different countries of the world are racing to announce their launches of their national CBDCs. Collectors of CryptoKitties and other NFT tokens are earning millions. and the new holders of DeFi platform governance tokens are busy voting to increase commission payments in their favor. This is happening right now while you're watching this video. Me? Let's try to understand all the circus a little better so as not to miss any opportunities that may come your way in the near future. Hi everyone, Oleg Ivanov with you on the Ivanov Invest channel with Token Stories. Here we're lifting the veil of the secrecy that surrounds the blockchain and cryptocurrency market and are trying to dispel few myths and make everything as simple as possible. Have I made myself clear, guys? Yeah, that's perfectly clear, Mickey. Make sure you subscribe to the channel not to miss the upcoming episodes. As today, we're continuing the first series of talking stories as we invite you to dive into the short and simplified tour of various types of cryptocurrencies. In previous videos, we have voiced our two basic principles. First, the principle of a car driver. I can drive a car, but I'm not obliged to learn the basics of the internal combustion engine or how the gearbox functions. So in here, we will ignore the more technically confusing issues of cryptography, transactions, about hashes and mining with consensus, and just concentrate on the most simplified classification of various cryptocurrencies, tokens and coins, so that at the usual user level, it may become a little bit more clear why there are so many different cryptocurrencies and how they can be useful for you and me now. And the second principle, one video, one topic. In our previous episodes, we discussed the differences between cryptocurrencies and electronic money, as well the differences between utility and security tokens, and as a bright example, why errors in this classification led to fines and closure of Pavel Durov's Telegram Open Network project. If you haven't watched these episodes yet, make sure you follow the links which would appear in the screen now. And today, in our third episode of Token Stories, we will go through the four layers of blockchain and understand the project tokens on each of these layers. Let's take a look. When Ethereum Network was launched, it empowered developers from all over the world to develop their own projects issue their own tokens, each with their own model of how such tokens should function. Projects were booming, millions of tokens have been issued, and millions more have already entered their existence. Ethereum alone has over 354,000 various tokens active as of January 2021. This sudden success, as could be expected, has attracted many, many teams that started to attempt to build a so-called Ethereum Kila, namely a blockchain platform that would allow users to issue their own crypto tokens. Tron, EOS, Waves, Tezos, Corda, Neo, Icon, Universal, Phantom, Polkadot, Freetone, year after year, the number of platforms is still increasing and the number of projects launched of them is only growing. This blockchain layer is commonly called layer 1, or the first layer of the blockchain architecture, or the tier of the blockchain protocol itself. There are two clear and distinct approaches that the founders of blockchain projects try to apply in the first wave of so-called ICOs, initial coin offerings, a name derived from a traditional IPO, an initial public offering in the traditional stock market. The first approach is to copy something that is already proven and working in the online business and to launch a version of it on blockchain. So why is it going live? Right now? Get your laptop out. A first wave of projects appeared attempting to build new online stores, social networks, cloud storage, messengers, online games, and blockchain casinos. The second group perceived this model of issuing crypto tokens as an opportunity to combine crowdfunding with a sort of loyalty program for their traditional businesses. Let me give you an example. 
Let's say I have a sand quarry somewhere in Moscow region, but I don't have the money to start developing it and uh, selling the sand, right? So what I do now is I release a sand coin, which will essentially give a discount of say 30% to the purchase of the quarter of all the sand reserves in my quarry in a year for the money raised now. In essence, I actually launch a loyalty program where for the first quarter of all my sand reserves, I give a 30% discount of the market price of my sand in exchange for the money now. With this money, I am buying necessary equipment, hiring staff and launching my business. Oh my God. And having sold only a quarter of my sand with this uh, discount, the remaining 75% of the sand I can safely sell at the market price. Great deal, isn't it? Everyone is happy. So thousands of projects were launched. Thousands of crypto tokens found their way in the hands of crypto investors across countries and countries. And these investors were now waiting impatiently for the long-awaited project releases, the growth of users, and accordingly for the increase in the token prices of such projects. But a lot went wrong. Leaving aside the usual statistics that even in traditional businesses, your success rate is around 10%. That is, one out of 10 projects generally survives and starts to develop some sort of revenue at all. The newly born blockchain industry brought in additional specific difficulties, which began to worsen the business survival statistics that were already far from being rosy. Let's leave the outright scammers and frauds out of the discussion. There are enough of those in almost any area, right? And let's just focus on what was reasonable. First and foremost, the obvious happened. Traditional businesses who launch such loyalty tokens for the sake of your typical crowdfunding or attracting capital from a large number of small investors from all over the world, suddenly one after another began to attract attention from regulators. Naturally, all the regulators, without mercy, began to smack their conclusions that such loyalty tokens are typical security tokens, which means that they fall under the traditional securities legislation, which means that you guys violated such regulations. So here's your fine, a ruling to seize your business or go to jail. And we talked about these differences between security and utility tokens in the last episode, so make sure you watch it for more details. And secondly, traditional businesses launching such loyalty tokens for objective reasons could only provide very moderate financial returns to their token holders, right? As traditional businesses can rely on reasonable growth rates in revenues and profits. This could hardly be compared to astronomic growth rates of Bitcoin, Ethereum and other true blockchain protocol tokens. So investors started to question the obvious. If I exchange my Ethereum and Bitcoin for the tokens of a new project, then I definitely expect the growth rate of such token to outperform Bitcoin and Ethereum in the first place, right? And where does this frenzied growth come from in traditional business? You can find it, right? So the popularity of such crowdfunding loyalty tokens and projects launching them gradually faded away. Projects from the first group, the ones trying to copy what is already proven and working in traditional online business, faced another problem. The problem of two technological limitations of the first generation of blockchain protocols. First, the throughput speed of transactions in Ethereum and Bitcoin networks turned out to be too low for current business tasks. For comparison, MasterCard and Visa are capable of processing up to 24,000 transactions per second, whereas Ethereum is only 284 transactions per second, with Bitcoin topping up to 7 transactions per second. 7. Imagine that you send a message through uh, an app that must wait in a line, just waiting for the other messages that were sent over blockchain before you with a window of only 200 messages per second across the whole world. Message sent. Message will arrive in 19 years. This is just impossible, right? This message app would never fly, would never work in real life. Earliest reply in 55 years. 55 years? 
This is a huge bottleneck. Secondly, as it turned out, the first generation of blockchain networks based on the so-called proof-of-work consensus algorithm turned out to be very, very expensive to scale. In other words, if you're a successful business and start to increase your user base and your users start to increase the number of transactions in the network, then in an ordinary world, the price per one such transaction is traditionally greatly reduced as the scale grows. Then, in blockchain, it is quite the opposite. As the network load grows, the transaction price also starts to rise, which is deadly for any business since growth not only does not allow you to reduce the costs, but it also doesn't allow you to predict these costs. You never know what price you will have to pay for a particular transaction in the future. It soon became clear that the first generation of blockchain protocols somewhat resembled the first generation of computers, which would fill in an entire floor in a university working on punch cards and capable of storing only 1000 numbers, which is somewhat around 16 to 17 kilobytes of data. Try to come up with an email service or Facebook or Instagram at that time it is impractical, if not impossible. Any attempts would be useless since computers simply would not cope with such tasks. Same with blockchains now. The first protocols turned out to be too slow and too expensive to run fast online services and applications that are already part of our everyday lives. This launched an arms race in blockchain. Guns! Speak guns! Oh, not guns. This is a gun. As a first step, Layer 1 blockchain protocols began to experiment with solutions that would increase their transaction speed and reduce their costs. A new consensus algorithm among miners appeared and there was a shift from the so-called proof-of-work to the proof-of-stake consensus algorithm. We will not go into details here, as it is quite a topic to itself, which we might uncover later in a, in a separate episode. But as many transitions from one working model to a new one might jeopardize your level of control and more importantly, earnings, not all miners were happy to move from the old model to the new one. Literally billions of dollars were at stake. So additional technological solutions started to appear that would allow to keep the current infrastructure within the current miners and users and would attempt to increase the speed of transactions and reduce the costs in existing blockchain protocols. This is how the solutions of the second layer began to appear and that are called layer two blockchain solutions. Projects of the second layer are typically trying to speed up uh, the transaction speed and reduce their costs within the selected blockchain protocol of the first layer by taking some of the activities, say transaction confirmations and the like, particularly off the layer one blockchain, transfer these to the layer two protocol, which may be run on a faster, cheaper proof of stake mode, make all necessary confirmations on this layer two and return the data bundle to the layer one. Such superstructure projects built on top of the main layer one blockchain protocols, depending on the problem being solved and the technology used, also began to receive an internal classification multi-chain, cross-chain, side-chain, DAG, off-chain calculators, etc. and etc. Amongst these layer 2 blockchain projects, one can distinguish Seller Network, Lightning Network, Raiden, Liquid, Bifrost, Matic, OmniSego, Plasma, Po Network, Scale, Truebit, Stockware, and of course a number and number of other projects. For those of you who would like to dive into the details, I suggest that you simply Google these types of second tier protocols and study the information on them. But even this was not enough. Many critics and ardent advocates of pure and total decentralization began to fiercely oppose the whole concept of the layer two protocols. All our lives, they might say, we have been fighting for the true decentralization and trust in the system only due to total transparency and consistency within one and understandable ecosystem. And here you are proposing to withdraw some parts of the calculations and votes, process them somewhere outside the system and return the data that we no longer know if it is trustworthy or not. You trust me? I do. No, no, no. Let's just stay within the framework of each individual layer one blockchain protocol and work on all the bottlenecks within the system. That is how Layer Zero blockchain projects appeared. 
layer zero blockchain projects would practically dive under the hood of the layer one blockchain protocols with their infrastructure technological solutions to improve throughput, most often by assessing the load on miners' nodes and redirecting traffic, routing the data flows, which as a result increase the transaction speed, block sizes, but all this within the layer one protocol and possibly more. The most well-known layer zero blockchain projects are Marlin, Bloxroot, BDN and Fiber. This is, after all, the favorite territory for the true taking geeks. <laughs> In the meantime, while the fight for the speed and the cost of transactions goes on the layers 0, 1 and 2 of the blockchain ecosystem, in the last layer, layer 3, is what the most of us understand better. This is layer 3 and, as it is also called, the app layer, where the battle for the business applications and users is unfolding. As one speaker quite poetically put it in one of the crypto conferences, I would not say that we all ended up building ghost towns with no life in them. I would rather say we have all built an exciting land of Narnia Each of our projects have beautiful forests, stunning rivers and waterfalls, gorgeous dragons fly around over majestic castle walls. There is only one thing left – for users to find that damn door in the back of the closet in the dusty attic, so that they can finally find their way to us and be stunned with all this beauty. The entire blockchain industry is fighting for new users, month after month, year after year, constantly improving their products and interfaces, but so far success has been the fate of only a small number of projects. While both micro startups and large companies are testing blockchain applications in various industries, the scale of users is gradually starting to grow. The areas where blockchain projects are gaining traction are mostly in banking and finance, cybersecurity, logistics and supply, healthcare, insurance and real estate, accounting and financing, cloud service, patents and intellectual property, data transmission and Internet of Things, charity, voting, electricity management, music and video games and crowdfunding, of course. More and more industries are testing blockchain solutions literally as we speak now. But what would be good to remember is that each of such projects on each of these four layers of blockchain infrastructure would launch their own crypto tokens with their own parameters and set of values and the performance of such tokens would depend on the variety of different factors in these layers. And in order not to get carried away with such an abundance of different cryptocurrencies, thanks to having an appearance of these stable tokens or stable coins, the ones that are pegged to a traditional currency, most likely US dollars, of course, but how do such stable coins or crypto dollars work? What are they backed with? And how do they differ from each other? We will talk about in our next episode of Token Stories. We would really appreciate if you support our channel by clicking the like and subscribe button. And also if you click on the bell, the notification bell up there uh, so that you don't miss on the next episodes. And thank you very much for watching. Also, make sure that you share your thoughts and your comments below. What are the strangest project tokens and conversely, the most promising project tokens that you've heard about? Please share them in the comments. I'm sure that many of us watching this video, including myself, would be very, very interested to read your stories about them. It's been a great pleasure to be with you guys today. Thanks for watching Oleg Ivanov, Ivanov Invest channel with Talking Stories. Have a good week and stay safe.